Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Courtside with Bielinson Tennis, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Here, as always, uh, with my co-host and Hall of Famer, Steve Flink. We will timestamp this. It's Tuesday night in the States. We had breaking news this morning. Unfortunately, Novak Djokovic had to withdraw from the rest of the tournament. Torn meniscus in his knee. We all knew he played um, two incredible matches prior to this. They went extremely long, specifically four hours and 29 minutes versus Musetti, and then four hours and 39 minutes versus Sarundalo. Steve, uh, you know, initial thoughts on this, obviously disappointing. Well, first of all, they were they may end up being the two most gripping, the fascinating matches of the tournament, compelling, whatever, whatever adjective you want to use. I mean, I I they were spirited clashes. The Musetti match was a night match, and Djokovic had nearly had a two-set lead. He's up a set, seven, five, four, one second set. Musetti breaks back, and then Novak had set point on his own serve, excuse me, own serve in the tie break. And Musetti very gamely came back and took that set and won the third. And then Novak just went on a rampage. He just went on a tear those last two sets and raised his game and was spurred on by the crowd. And from two all in the fourth set, he lost only one more game, one six love in the fifth, dropped only 10 points in the fifth. So that was a really exhilarating win for him, but he only had 37 hours before he came back to face Sarundalo in the round of 16. And just and one was- thing before we get to Sarundalo, you know, Massetti, he's eight and four in Roland Garros, Steve. His four losses were 2021 versus Novak, where he led two sets to love. 2022 was to Sitsipas. 2023 was to Alcaraz. And 2024 was the match you just talked about. Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. He's not had much luck. I will say this. People do remember that match in 2021 because it was one of two comebacks that Novak made from two sets down in the course of winning that championship. One was against Massetti. The second was against against Stefano uh, Tsitsipas in the final. But that match that you said he played that day, he played very well. And he won a couple of tie breaks from Novak to go up two sets. But Novak had lead, had a breakup in the first set, a big lead in the tie break. And he didn't, he really should have, shouldn't have been down. And you said he didn't play anything like the level he did this time, David. He was spectacular. Neither one of them had an easy time hitting through the court because it was such cool conditions. So they had just grueling, taxing, uh, fascinating rallies from those first couple of sets and really all the way through. And the crowd was, was, found it so enjoyable. And they were torn. They came round to Novak when he was down and on the, looking like he was on the brink in the fourth. But they appreciated the, the skills and artistry of both players. And it was a much higher quality match than the Musetti Djokovic match three years ago. Yes, I'm lucky again because he finally I felt like his legs went a little bit in the fifth that Novak finally got to him physically but it took until the fifth for that to really happen so okay he recovers from that match he goes out against Sarundalo and the pattern is similar David because this time he wins the first set but more easily he wins it 6-1 and then the knee injury occurred early in the second and as as you know and as followers know He was not happy with the conditions this year in terms of the number of times that the groundsmen were willing to sweep the courts. He was actually having what a lot of fans may not have realized. He was actually having this discussion with umpires and officials all the way, really from his second round match on after because he felt like around the baseline, things were getting very choppy, a lot of bad bounces, too slippery. And he felt like he was falling. He knows that he falls in matches, but not as frequently as he was this time around. So, he he did he did do something to his knee in that third game of the second set. There's no doubt about it, and, and that's when the trouble started. He got the trainers at the changeover, and the rest of that set, and they came back again at the next changeover, and they they treated did the best they could to help him with his knee. And he was appreciative, but it didn't solve the problem. So he but he kept managing to fend off break points all the way through that set. You know, two here, two there. Really starting with the one-two game, he kept fending off break points all the way up until he had an easy hold at four or five. But when he served to stay in the set at five, six, he played a, a bad game. And and uh, Sarundula took full advantage, and suddenly it's now a set on. You could see in the third that Djokovic, a lot of drop shots he wasn't chasing. He, he wasn't able – he definitely was not himself physically. And he was sort of 
picking his spots on when to run. And Sarundo will win this set very comfortably, 6-3, one break. They go to the fourth, and Sarundo is up 4-2 in the fourth. Yeah, I mean, this was just, this was as close to being eliminated as, as you can almost and I possibly think at, be. Yep, and I think at 2-4, Djokovic, he said after the match that the painkillers that they gave him earlier finally kicked in late in the fourth. You could see that because in the middle, even when he was serving at 2-4, still wasn't feeling great, and he played kind of a dangerous serve and volley point on the first point of that seventh game and kind of got away with it because – uh, Sarundal had the court open to pass him and Novak guessed right. And then he hit a couple of blinding winners where he just sort of went for broke in a way a little bit more freely than he would normally do. And uh, but he got through that game and then broke finally in the next game. Now, keep in mind, David, he had not broken uh, Sarundalo since the first set. He'd had three break points in the whole match before he finally breaks him to get back to four all in the fourth. Still was hard fought to the end of the fourth. He's down break point at five all, he gets out of it. And then there was a long, uh, it, it, great game to finish it off, to break again for seven five. And uh, the crowd went wild. And now you started to see Djokovic lifting his game. He goes up two love in the fifth, 30 love. But but Sarundalo put on quite a surge there and broke back and finally it would, uh, so he got back on serve, and finally, with Sarundalo serving at at three four, he had forty love, and they had just a couple of mind boggling points that they played in that game. And Djokovic finally broke him with a forehand winner on the baseline. It was close yeah. on the baseline too, back yep. in the line almost. Yeah, yeah. The, the umpire got and check, went out and checked the mark, and Sarundalo saw him shaking his head. He was looking, he was looking at the umpire. She came down and kind of like, well, I don't know if it was in or out. He wasn't trying to point to a mark that he thought was out. And sure right. enough, she confirmed it was in. Novak serves out the match. Another cl close call on match point for Novak where he stopped playing and got the umpire to check the mark and he was correct and the ball was wide. All right, the bottom line is, obviously those were two immensely gratifying wins. But he said in his press conference, he was very clear in his press conference afterwards that uh, he wasn't sure he was going to be able to, he, wanted, he knew he was going to have to have the knee checked out today. He didn't really know exactly what it was. And uh, there was a chance he wouldn't be able to play that this court his quarterfinal against Casper Ruud, and sadly that was the case. Would have been a, re a revival of last year's final, which Djokovic won in straight sets. So too bad because I mean he leaves having tried to defend his title, having not been beaten on the court, but having been defeated by an injury that could well keep him out of Wimbledon and might keep him out of the Olympics afterwards. These were the three events along with the U.S. Open that he was targeting for this year, particularly after his Australian Open semifinal loss. And now, you know, I mean, we, we don't think of him having lingering injuries. We think of him playing through injuries as he's done at the Australian a couple of times where he can sort of manage it. But this became unmanageable. And it, it's revealing that he did say those painkillers definitely helped him because he it was the first time he felt pain free was late in the fourth and through the fifth of the Sarundalo match. But Obviously, there was no remedy for this. You know, he, he's got a, an injury. He's going to have to deal with it. And who knows when he's going to be back. And so strange to say at this point in the season that Novak has yet to win a title in this calendar year. So. Well, you know, it seemed like one of those uh, one of those stories in the making when he won the second five setter that, you know, maybe he's going to pull off one of these miraculous runs. I mean. The one we talked about in 2021 was pretty remarkable to be two sets down against Musetti and win that. Then to then to beat Nadal from a set down in the semis and then to beat Tsitsipas from two sets down again in the finals. He's had some tournaments like that that were astounding with the five setters. And I had the feeling when he when he won this Rundelo match, maybe this is one of those moments. But, of course, we didn't know until he came in the press conference and really ex explained in detail what was going on and how he was going to have to have it all checked out today exactly what he was up against so it's a shame because the way things were set up david we thought potentially we could get uh, djokovic against either sinner or alcaraz in the final now obviously that possibility is gone we still have root up there which is terrific considering he's been in the last two finals so good for him he, he's lucky to get the benefit of a default but he's also played great to get here to get to that round and maybe deserve, maybe maybe this is his year then you have Zarev. we talked about Zarev. How, you know, coming in, he seemed like having he, he would have a good shot. He's been through a couple of very difficult five setters himself in the last two rounds and managed to get by Greek score. And then, yeah, to Steve, by to, Steve, just a couple thoughts on Zverev, because to me, 
uh, and I know there's still so much work to do. It's so hard to win one of these things. And that's why the big three just, it was, they just made it look so easy, which is ridiculous. But to me, it looks like it's possibly lining up for Sasha. I mean, he, he faces Rafa in the very first round, right? He gets through that one. He then plays, he gets, he plays a couple rounds later in the third round, Greek Spore. Greek Spore is up 4-1 and serving in the fifth. Sasha gets through that one, right? It's like he's almost, it's it's almost like falling in, in place for him. But then I look at the draw still, Steve, he still has to beat Demon Hour, Rude, and then Sinner or Alcaraz. I mean, it's so yeah, hard but to they, win all this. Also, with the trial going on at the same time. Now, he's probably trying his best to compartmentalize all that, but he does have that as a distraction. Yeah, it's true. But to, the only thing I would add to what it's true, what he's been through a couple of, of wars, obviously, the Greek sport double breakdown in the fifth. And then, of course, in the Ogaruna match, five sets. He, he, he was five again and he was down two sets to one and had to come back and win a tie break in the fourth after he'd served for the set at five three and then finally pulled away in the fifth and played great clutch tie break to get into the fifth. But look, the scenarios you described, it could have been that he was going to have to play this match against Demon or to play Djokovic in the semis to then play a Carlos or Sinner in the final. So in that sense, he got a break there, and we'll see, because if he's able to beat Di Menor, and I give him a slight edge, not a great edge on form, but because Di Menor is ready for a moment like this, but I'd still favor Sasha slightly, then I'd give him a pretty, I'd give him a nice edge going in against Rude. With all, with no disrespect to Rude, I think the matchup is good for Zarev. So who knows, maybe the stars are aligned, but either way, if, if he does get to the final, he's going to be playing an in-form Alcaraz or Sinner because they both have come alive, David. Think about them coming into the tournament off those injuries. And Sinner was out. He had lost his sits of positive Monte Carlo. Then he's missing everything because of his, his hip. He tried to play that, you know, he tried to play once more. He had to pull out of the, this next event with an injury with the hip. And then Carlos only played the one tournament where he lost to Rublev. So both those guys didn't have their typical preparation for Roland Garros. And, and you wonder, had they totally healed from the injuries? Were they ready and, and they hadn't, didn't have the normal preparation? Now they both look in excellent form. For those just listening to us on audio, you know, Steve and everybody watching this, uh, you know, we post these on YouTube as well. I'm smiling, just shaking my head, just, just outlining and talking through this, how difficult it is for any one of these players to win one of these slams. Um, Let's flip it over to to Coco Gauff for a little bit because she is quietly, I'd say quietly until today, um, really flown through this draw. Hadn't lost a set until this morning when she played on Jabor. Coco was head-to-head, led that 4-2. Now she leads it 5-2. She beat on convincingly at Roland Garros a couple years back. Um, she's lost one set. She now plays Iga. Iga's only lost one set that that crazy battle versus Osaka. Iga is 10 and one, Steve, versus Coco. The one win being last summer at Cincy in the semis that Coco won. I mean, there's a good chance. And tomorrow morning, we got um, Rabakina and Savalenka. They're going to be favored. There's a good chance we have one, two, three, and four on the women's side in the semis competing for those. Yeah. Five. First of all, just a brief, uh, uh, I just want to comment a little bit about Coco versus Ange Dubur today. Dubur really impressed me. She played a terrific first set, got the break at three all and, and made it count, served it out, went at six, four. And then it kind of turned in the fourth game of the second set. Coco broke, went up three, one, lost her serve in the next game, but ran out the set from there. And then finally in the third, she she prevailed and despite a difficult game serving it out where she needed three match points had to save a break point it was a very solid effort from coco i think in the end she played really smart ten- i was impressed despite the fact that she got pushed to three odds had played exceedingly well in the first and i think that coco just played smart percentage tennis she kind of broke down she actually was a little bit more reliable off the forehand than Anz was in the end i thought that made a big difference so it was a, i think it was Despite going three, it was an encouraging win for her. Having said that, you just alluded to the career record versus Iga. She's lost a final here to Iga. The one win she has is on hard courts. We all know that as as magnificent as Iga is, as the clear-cut world number one, that she is 
at her very best on clay. You know, she has yet to reach quite that same lofty level on the other surface. She's won the U.S. Open. Don't get me wrong. She's a great player on any surface. But on clay, she's almost invincible. She's come in here on such a high. She beat Coco uh, the last time they played pretty solidly. So I just feel like no reason for Coco to come in here believing she has no chance. But I just believe that she'd have to play the clay court match of her life. And even that might not be enough as Naomi Osaka discovered when she got to match point in the third set, when she led 5-2 in the third, had a match point at 5-3 in the third and could not close out Iga. And since then, David, Iga has been Lights rid out. ridiculously good. Yeah, I mean, had a love and love match, beat Von Drusseva. Uh, she crushes Von Drusseva, loses two games. I mean, she's just been, she's back to invincibility. So I just feel like, Coco's got to be aggressive, take a few chances, calculated risks, serve as well as she possibly can. But I think she's going to be hard pressed to take a set. If she does it, I, I tip my hat to her. If she can manage to even get a set off, off this ego, who is at the very top of her game, that's it's, it's going to be a monumental effort. And we won't know until tomorrow morning because they play the, the the quarters tomorrow. But assuming Rabakina and Savalenka get through, by the way, that 17-year-old Mira Andreva. She beat, um, she's been having a great tournament. She beat Peyton, Star Peyton Stearns, who we've talked about previously. Big fan of Peyton. Peyton had a very good win earlier over Kasakina. Um, Mira Andreeva, 17 years old. She plays Sabalenka. Assuming Sabalenka and Rabakina win their quarter, they'll face each other in the semi. Are you picking uh, Sabalenka in that one? Yeah, slightly. Very, very slight. I, I'm gonna, I shouldn't say slightly. I'm picking her, but with, with some reservations because I have great respect for Ibaka and when she's been healthy this year and she can play on any surface. And uh, I, yeah, I'm going to give Sab Sabalenka, I'm going to give her an edge in that match, but not a great edge. But either way, I, I'm, I'm going with, with Iga to win the title uh, because I just feel like she's primed for this and she's been unbeatable on the clay leading up to Roland Garros. And, and actually, I think the, the, um, the scare that she got from Osaka, what she was made to go through against, uh, she could never have envisioned an Osaka that was going to play at that level on clay courts because Naomi has never played at that level on clay courts. So, and yet she, she weathered the storm. She hung in so well in the third. She showed us what, a, what an incredibly resilient competitor she is and, and remain composed and just basically said to herself, I'm going to make her beat me. I'm not giving it to her. She's going to have to earn this. I don't care how well she's played until now. And sure enough, from two, five down, she runs out the match. So I just feel like that did her a lot of good. And since then, she's looked even more unstoppable than she had in the earlier rounds. So I definitely like her, but I, I'm, I think it's great. I hope we get the scenario you described. I hope that Rabak and Sabalenka do get through. That's a semifinal well worth watching, and it produces a final that will be captivating for the fans, even, even if Ego were to win it in straight sets. Agreed. Agreed wholeheartedly. Let's see how that develops. All right, let's focus on the Carlos Sinner. Carlos versus Sinner semifinal. Because head-to-head, -head, Steve, they're four, they're four and four. They're deadlocked at four and four. But they've never played at Roland Garros before. So this is their first time on clay. Um, you said both. They're kind of rounding into form. They've been dealing with some injuries leading up. They both have looked very good throughout this tournament so far. Um, what are you looking forward to seeing? And, and, and who's your pick there? Yeah, I'm having a very hard time making a call on form. And, and I make this pred prediction with absolutely no confidence whatsoever. But I go, I just lean ever so slightly toward Carlos because he just looks supremely confident to me. And he, he did a nice job today. He was just cruising through his serve against Sitsipas, you know, up until the middle of the second set at one stage, he won 28 out of 37 points. So what first seven service games, he loses nine points. So he's averaging about a point a game. Uh, he's serving 80, 85% first serve percentage of he, he just and backing it up beautifully. And Sitsipas still managed to get the second set into a tie break. And, and after being four one down, but Carlos had only lost his serve the one time. He was dominant in the tie break, which he won seven, three and pulled it. And now granted Sinner also won his match over Grigor Dimitrov in straight sets. He didn't serve it out at five, four in the third, a minor bump in the road because he closed out in the tie break in the third set. So they're both in form. 
Carlos won the match that made it 4-4 in the rivalry in the final of Indian Wells, coming from behind after losing the first set 6-1. Uh, he played great that day. I thought Sinner looked a bit beaten up. There were talk of some my, niggling injuries. He didn't look to no me to be 100%, taking no nothing away from Carlos. No but I, I just feel like right now, maybe Carlos, despite continuing to wear whatever that brace or bandage, that big, it looks so cumbersome and uncomfortable, but he, it doesn't seem to be bothering him anymore. He, just, it, it's not, it's, he looks like the old Carlos. So, that's obviously precautionary, and he's gotten used to wearing it. And he, he just looks to me to be that little bit more confident. On the other hand, the, one, the reason I have, I have to doubt my own prediction is that I feel like Sinner, you know the level. I feel like we know he's going to go out there and play really well. He's going to play to a certain standard automatically because he has a safety net on his shots. He's more, to me, a percentage player. Carlos is the explosive one. Carlos is more unpredictable. There can be more ups and downs. That's why I have some doubts, because over the course of five sets, he's going to have to sustain it against one of his premier rivals right now. And certainly the rival is, is going to be his most formidable rival over the next 10 years. So and so every time they step out there, it's such an important match. And the likelihood is whichever one wins it is the favorite in the final, not that it's going to be automatic against Zareb or Rude or, 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 or uh, De Menor. So I just... I like the fact that I don't trust my own instincts here because that's what, to me, the match is so intriguing that way. I, I'd say coming into in, coming into the Indian Wells final, I thought Sinner would win. But Carlos turned the tables brilliantly in the last two sets. So that is a confidence booster for him. On the other hand, that's the only tournament that Carlos has won since Cincinnati last summer. Sinner's the one that actually has been in more of a winning pattern, as we know, the way he started the year and winning the Australian Open, the way he ended last year so brilliantly and leading, leading Italy to the Davis Cup and just being the most consistent player, uh, you know, just being so consistent down the stretch of 2023. So there's, so, you can come up with five good reasons to pick either one of those guys. What I'm hoping we get, David, is a five-setter. I think there's a, a reasonable chance it could go five, given the form of both. And, yeah. and so that, I hope they just take us down to the wire and stretch themselves to their limits and give the fans – and epic, which is entirely possible. And, you know, note, Yannick Sinner will be number one in the rankings come Monday. So that right. Imagine. By and the if way, he wins the French, Steve. He got the calendar slam yeah. still in play there. Yeah, he does. He does. Absolutely right. And he'll be a big threat at Wimbledon, no doubt about it. He's in the semis of Wimbledon last year and lost to Novak. Carlos, of course, won Wimbledon last year. So they they, they could well meet, there at, meet at Wimbledon this time around. But I feel like... Uh, I'd like to know your prediction. I'd like to get your call on Carlos and Sinner. Yeah, so I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna throw you a little curveball because I'm still sticking, I, and I'm hesitant against it. I'll tell you why, but I'm still sticking with my pick. It looks to me this is lining up for Sasha Vera. Now I'm hesitant, and I told you why earlier. But the only hesitancy in that is that he still got demon hour rude and then center Alcaraz. I mean, he's still got, he's, he's gotten through a lot of tests starting in the very first round with Rafa. Right. And then we already talked about Greek sport, the uh, Runa in five sets. So he's played a ton of tennis, a lot of mental energy as well. He's got other stuff going on off the court, the trial, which we mentioned earlier. Um, I just feel like it's lining up for him. Now that being said would not surprise me in the least if he loses any of those matches leading up to the final. Um, but there's something he's been close in the past. There's something telling me that, that maybe this is his turn. I know people are going to, if he does win it, people are going to, you know, have a tough time trying to reconcile the fact that he has this off court issue that he's dealing with too. So um, I'm, I'm with you. I'm not confident in any of my picks, but I'm I'm thrilled to see how this this latter part of the tournament plays out on both the women's side and the men's side because like you on the women's side I hope it's the top four seeds in the semis. Yeah, no, I got I I I, I hear you on all the rest, and I felt going into the tournament that Zara was going to had a great chance. I still do. I'm not I'm not as concerned for him looking at it through his lens. I'm not. I don't think it's that daunting to when you've gone this far and been pushed that far in two five sets in a row to think about playing Demon or to play Rude. I, that part doesn't worry me that much for, for him. 
it's war. It's a, can he get his level up a bit higher than it's been? We saw him against Rafa prime for the match. He played his very best tennis against Rafa. He hasn't played as well since, frankly. Uh, his forehand has not been as good since. He, you felt like he could let loose. He could hit out freely on the forehand and hardly miss and hit dazzling winners one time after another against Rafa. Hasn't been the case. It's been up and down since. But I feel like if he can get back to the level we saw against Rafa, he'll beat the other two guys and be in the final. But I'm, I, I just want to know who do you think wins? Who wins Sinner and Alcaraz? I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with in a small margin. I'm going to go with Carlos. Um, yeah. He hasn't won it yet. We're going to get a new, we're going to get a first time winner, whoever wins. Yeah. You know that. Um, I'm going to go with Carlos and I'm hoping, and uh, I'm not hoping, Zverev is hoping Carlos and Sinner play for eight hours and yeah. just oh. beat the heck out of each other. And maybe, you know, Zverev will have a little bit more energy than the winner of, of that match. But I'm, I'm going slightly slightly uh, none of my predictions i am confident on that's what's so great about this yeah. like there's enticing matchups the rest of the way i'll go well, slightly carlos over center and then sasha to win it but again now remember I, sorry david i didn't mean to interrupt you remember that a couple of years ago you know uh, zara played a tremendous match to beat to upset carlos in the semifinals before he played that <laughs> that memorable match against Rafa where he went down so badly with the ankle injury. Right. But he played a terrific match against Carlos, beat him there. He beat him again at the Australian in the quarters this year. You know, in between, he lost to him at the U.S. Open last year. But I've, I've seen him on his best days play some spectacular tennis and serve, essentially serve Carlos off the court, which is not easy to do. But he's done it twice. Uh, I, that's why I would that to me would be maybe the most intriguing final. But but Zarev and Sinner, who had a blockbuster five setter at the U.S. Open last year. I mean, listen, that also is that's mouthwatering, just as almost as mouthwatering as Zarev versus Alcaraz. And, I, and you know, Casper Ruud, Casper Ruud's made the finals the last two years, right. losing to Rafa and Novak. I mean, yeah. it's great. Everybody left. Has I I feel like the odds for everyone left are very very close. Yeah, I just think that there's something right now, considering the way Zarev has been knocking on the door for so long. Here's a two-time ATP Finals champion, Masters 1000s. I mean, the guy has shown has done it everywhere else. Finals of the U.S. Open on the brink in 2020 and doesn't put away Dominic Team loses in five despite serving for the match in the fifth and being up two sets to love earlier so he's been so close on so many can even this year in the semifinals after beating carlos he's two sets up against medvedev to get into the final and have a shot at sinner there so he's been agonizingly close so i think from the standpoint of, of just just having followed his career i i'd like to see it be him in the final win or lose but i'd like to see him square off against one of the two young giants alcaraz or sinner that to me would be the most appealing final. Not that all the other matchups wouldn't be uh, great in their own right. It's going to be exceptional. I can't wait for it. I know you can't wait for it. And I know that all tennis fans across the world can't wait for the latter stages of both, both fields, the women and the men. This is going to, this is played out perfect and we can't wait for an exciting conclusion. Thanks so much, Steve. Thank you, David. Enjoyed it.